Thanks, Bruce. Thanks very much. Those were great, great introductory comments. Um, never heard the word tweet so much in this room before. <laughs> yeah. um, and thank you all for being here today at Brookings, you know, to the folks in the room, and thank you to all those who are watching um, online. Um, I do want to point out that, as Bruce mentioned, although this is definitely something that we have been working on at Brookings for a number of years, it's not just something we cooked up here, you know, on Massachusetts Avenue. This is something that we have been working intensely with a whole network of scholars and practitioners all across the country, many folks actually who are in the room today, um, because this is not something that we could just identify here in Washington. This is not just a made in Washington type approach, but really does reflect, I think, a lot of the, uh, the, the unique traditions, the history, and the reality of what's going on in metropolitan areas all across the country. Um, but I do want to thank, um, just very quickly, thank the authors again, Adi, Elizabeth, um, Alan, who you'll be hearing from in a minute. Um, Bruce talked about the incredible amount of effort that went into this project. This is really a testament um, to their hard work and really their dedication to Brookings' um, commitment to quality, uh, impactful, and independent uh, work. Um, so they had the hard part, right? So in many ways, I had the easy part being up here today uh, making this presentation. And, and the fun part, really, because it's good to be talking about transit in metropolitan areas here at Brookings um, this afternoon. We found as we were doing this work, that people are passionate about this issue. I think we were surprised, frankly, about how passionate people really care about this in their, in their area. Not just because of the reasons that we're going to talk about today, but they really understand, I think, what transit means for a functioning healthy city and healthy suburbs and healthy metropolitan areas. And that's a good thing, because we believe that we may have a public transit moment before us in the United States today. For major metropolitan systems with iconic transit, like we have in New York uh, and in Washington, to new light rail lines that have just opened up in places like Phoenix, uh, places like Charlotte, uh, to growing bus networks in places like Colorado Springs or in Albuquerque, New Mexico, even the ferry boats that traverse the Puget Sound and the Boston Harbor, public transit is a critical part of the economic and social fabric of these as well as metropolitan areas all across the US. Every year, 10 billion trips are taken using public transit a number that we have seen has generally been trending up in recent years. Almost all of these trips occur in the nation's 100 largest metros. As Bruce mentioned, and if you've been following our work, these places are the real heart of the American economy and harbor two-thirds of our population, generate 75% of our gross domestic product, and account for 95% of all transit passenger miles traveled. So we look at the top 100 metros, but this is where almost all of this transit is, is occurring. And every single one of the top 100 metros has some form of public transit. Education, shopping, recreation, healthcare, these are some of the reasons why people take transit in America today. But one of the most important, and the reason we're here to talk about today, is to get to work. While three of four commutes still occur alone in a car, recent statistics show that the share of Americans getting to work by transit grew during the last decade for a first time literally in a generation. Despite the recent leveling off due to the recession, we do consider this to be a moment for public transit in America. And there are several driving forces behind that. First is the emerging disruption of escalating gas prices we already talked about. The US Energy Information Administration, along with most Americans, folks here in the room, are already looking out for $4 gas, if we're not seeing it already, which I know we are. These rising fuel prices will drive increased demand for transit as commuters seek to reduce their overall traffic costs. But whether commuters will shift to transit is not just a result of this or a result of the prices, um, but we really, it's really the result of many things, including whether or not transit is even available and whether it gets them to where they want to go. So more on that in just a minute. Transit will also benefit from the fact that we continue to be a growing nation. By 2050, we could grow incredibly by another 130 million people. That's more than the entire population that today lives west of the Mississippi River. What is more is that three quarters of this growth will occur in metropolitan areas. Another driving force is the imperative of lower carbon. Today in the US, transportation is the single largest contributor to our nation's carbon, carbon footprint. And even small increases in driving will still spew out more and more carbon, potentially wiping out the benefits that are gained from more fuel efficient cars and the expansion of cleaner fuel alternatives. So given all this, the natural question that we want to talk about today is are we ready for this public transit moment? How well does transit cover our metropolitan areas? How well does transit connect workers to jobs? 
And how well does transit function for those workers who may need it the most? Are we ready? Our challenge is that, and when we tried to answer these questions, um, we found that strikingly little was known about this across the country. In the U.S. today, we have no consistent transit information across and between metropolitan areas. So to better understand these issues, we analyzed, collected, and in some cases, we actually had to build geospatial data for 371 systems that provide transit service in the nation's 100 largest metro areas. As you can imagine, that data collection was the hard part. In some cases, the data were easy to find, such as the information that goes into web-based transit routing tools, which many of the nation's transit systems use, many folks here in the room probably use. In other cases, like when we got this information on paper, <laughs> we had to create digital route and schedule information from scratch. All this was very time consuming. But the transit database and the comprehensive database that resulted provides the first comparable detailed look at the relationship between transit, service, income, and the location of employment. So let's see how all this plays out in Denver, a metro area with a robust network of transit routes. As you can see, this really mirrors the street grid in that metro area. So a worker living in Littleton, a southern suburb, could walk to the new light rail line a few blocks from their home and ride it all the way to work near 16th in California, near the, uh, the, the corner of downtown Denver. There are no transfers required, and this whole trip would take you about 34 minutes from door to door. To get to a job in the eastern suburb of Stapleton, that commuter would continue on the train, then transfer it to a bus, and that whole trip would take about 85 minutes. So our model simulated billions and billions of similar commute trips for every neighborhood with transit service in the top 100 metro areas. That may not mean a lot to the people in the room, it meant an awful lot to us. <laughs> <laughs> so what do we find? First is that nationally, we face a transit paradox between transit coverage and job access. Second is that by virtue of policy or the market and really a little luck, quite frankly, there's clear variation between metropolitan areas. And third, we definitely need a new game plan for helping Americans get to work. So to start, let me return to that paradox, which is that while some form of transit serves a large share of metropolitan America, that same service really does fall short in connecting residents to employment, especially when those jobs are outside of the urban core. So let's dig into that first part a little. Where and whom does transit serve today in metropolitan America? For transit coverage, we're talking here about the share of working age residents living in neighborhoods within at least three quarters of a mile of a transit stop. Based on that definition, we found that across the nation's 100 largest metros, nearly 70% of working age people live in residence with uh, live in neighborhoods with transit coverage. Or to put it another way, while almost 40 million Americans are without transit service uh, in their communities, another 88 million Americans do have transit coverage. Now, we recognize that service and convenience are not the same thing, and all transit stops are not created equal. But overall, I think it's, we, we can understand that we found these numbers really good, and we found them really quite encouraging. And while 70% of working age people have transit coverage, we found that the numbers are even better for poor neighborhoods as 89% of metropolitan residents in lower income communities are served. This greatly exceeds the shares for middle and high income neighborhoods, which you can see are at about 70 and 53% respectively. Not surprisingly, given the well-known historical connections between cities and transit agencies, we found that amazing, an amazing 94% of city residents live in neighborhoods with transit coverage. Now, I know these are an awful lot of numbers, um, in a very abstract way. So let me drill in just for a moment on central Virginia and see how all this plays out in one place in metropolitan Richmond, which is outlined there in gray with the city of Richmond in the middle. The darker colored neighborhoods you're seeing here are those with higher population densities. And as we zoom into one neighborhood close to the downtown part of the city, um, you can clearly see the bus lines that are out there in white and the hub and spoke nature of the transit network. Dense neighborhoods in central cities generally have strong, co strong co transit coverage like this, as we're seeing here in downtown Richmond. But that's just a city example. So what about the two-thirds of Americans then who live in suburbs? What do we think transit coverage looks like for them? Well, we found that only 58% of suburban residents live in neighborhoods that are served by transit. So let's go back and look out into the Richmond suburbs, such as this relatively dense neighborhood west of the city that is literally at the end of the line for bus service. 
As you can see, its neighboring suburban communities generally lack transit service coverage altogether, and we found that this is typical in many metros across the U.S., and I'll get to that in just a minute. Now, while these city suburban trends have emerged over the decades for an awful lot of reasons, they are in some ways a bit anachronistic now that we know a majority of jobs and a majority of low-income households uh, are in the suburbs. So the future efficacy of metropolitan transit systems will thus rest squarely on their ability to reach the growing segment of suburban and particularly low-income suburban commuters. This leads directly into the other part of the transit paradox, which is that in most metro areas, transit does fall short in connecting workers to jobs, as I mentioned. In other words, and as Bruce mentioned, it's not enough for us just to know that transit exists in these neighborhoods. Transit doesn't do you any good if it doesn't get you to where you want to go within a reasonable period of time. So job access is the other critical part of the analysis. For this, we're talking about the share of metropolitan jobs that a typical working age resident can reach by transit within 90 minutes. Based on this definition, we found that 30% of jobs are accessible. Or put differently, 70% of jobs in the nation's largest metro areas are inaccessible to the average commuter. Here too, there are important splits between cities and suburbs to keep in mind. For one, the job access figures are much better for city neighborhoods than suburban ones. But again, obviously the point is not that a worker can reach all jobs throughout their metro area. What really matters is what kind of jobs you can get to, and then are you qualified for those jobs that are out there. And we found that workers in neighborhoods with transit can reach over, or can reach just over one quarter of job, of, I'm sorry, we can reach just over one quarter of low and medium skilled jobs within 90 minutes, compared to one third of metro area jobs in high skill industries. So clearly what emerges then is this mismatch. High income households are in neighborhoods with the worst transit coverage, yet high skilled jobs are the most accessible by transit. On the flip side, low income households are in neighborhoods with the best transit coverage, but in, they are in many ways less able to use transit to get to these jobs that they likely qualified for. It's not exactly neat, but you can see where the mismatch occurs. And taken together, these findings suggest that in many places, there is a disconnect between where people live and where people work. However, these aggregate numbers also hide a great amount of variation. We are a big, big country. For example, we found a lot of difference in transit coverage rates between these metropolitan areas. So let's take Los Angeles, for example, where 96% of metropolitan residents live in neighborhoods with transit service of some kind. As you can see here, nearly every one of these neighborhoods has some kind of transit coverage. Other major metros like New York or Miami, uh, here in Washington, D.C., all these places have transit coverage that far exceeds the national average. Contrast this with metros in the south, like Atlanta, where less than 40% of residents have transit coverage. This map shows a concentration of service in the city, but as you can see, very limited service outside of that urban core. Other southern metros like uh, Birmingham and Nashville, Greenville, South Carolina, all lack service to over two-thirds of their metropolitan residents. There's also variation then in terms of the jobs that these metros, in these metros that are accessible by transit, so the second part of that paradox. In Salt Lake City, in San Jose, in uh, Portland, Oregon, the typical commuter can get to a large share of these metro jobs by transit. But check out the figures then for places like Youngstown, or Orlando, or McAllen, Texas, much, much less. So to better account for the big picture, we brought together the transit coverage and the transit job access rankings and, and, and ratios into a combined transit performance metric to indicate then the best and worst metropolitan performers. 15 of the top 20 metro areas that rank the highest on this score are found in the west, and 15 of the 20 metros that score the lowest are found in the south. Well, why? Why do western metros seem to perform the best? Well, for starters, it looks like these are places that have invested heavily in their transit systems, and we're not just talking about the new rail service or the light rail systems. The bus networks in many of these metros are extensive, and they reach well out into the suburbs, intentionally out into the suburbs. They're also much more likely than others to combine comprehensive planning with growth management policies that employ infrastructure regulations such as impact fees. Jobs and housing are more compact than in other metro areas, and it makes it all easier to serve by transit. They're also much more likely to have topographical barriers to development. This is the luck part. Mountains, deserts, oceans, things like that, all help hem in the outward trajectory of growth in many of these western places. Okay, why then do southern metros perform the worst? Well, 
obviously, it's a little bit of the reverse. These are generally not places with extensive transit coverage. And the transit service that does exist generally does not reach out into the suburbs. We saw that in Atlanta. They tend to not employ innovative land use tools and instead stick with a traditional regulatory framework where residential and commercial uses are kept separate and development is spread out. In such places, it's very difficult to connect people to jobs by transit in any kind of efficient manner. And to go along with that, these are places that have few topographical barriers to control the outward migration of growth. So the bottom line here is that the success of transit in helping commuters get to work rises and falls on much more than just the transit system itself. Transportation networks interact with the location of employment and housing in really very complex ways that influence a lot of the metrics that we analyzed here in this report. So given all that, my final point is that we definitely need a new game plan for helping Americans get to work. As Bruce said in his introduction, in the post-recession economy, we need more jobs and we need better jobs, and we also need to make sure that those jobs are accessible. But while there is definitely potential for a transit moment in the U.S. today, severe budget constraints and rapidly fluctuating energy prices and transportation costs complicate this route then to broader economic recovery. In the short run, transit agencies face real threats in, form of, in the form of service cuts, delayed investments, as well as deferred maintenance. Revenue declines are widespread and many agencies are already facing increases on, in terms of fares to go along with operating cuts in order to close these yawning budget gaps in many metro areas. At the same time, transit agencies and commuters alike are struggling with the impacts of higher gasoline prices, as Bruce mentioned. As rising prices put greater pressure on household budgets, it's clear that more and more people are going to be looking for alternatives to the driving that they're doing today. In light of these challenges, we do need a three-part plan. The first thing is that we need a total transportation approach to job access. Some metros like Washington, like Los Angeles, like Hartford, Connecticut will and should continue to build out their rail and bus rapid transit infrastructure uh, to address the coverage gaps that we've identified here in this report. But metros also need a range of other transportation options like car sharing, which is already underway in many metropolitan areas and privately run services that connect to corporate campuses like they do out in metropolitan Seattle. But as we noted, our results show that it's not just enough to have robust transit or transportation service. So the second thing is to go beyond transportation and link accessibility to next generation metropolitan growth policy and practice. What does that mean? To make the most out of existing service and plan for future routes and investments, metro leaders need to pursue integrated problem solving across a range of disciplines. One way we think is to incorporate land use policies to improve job access and that may do that better than just these transit interventions alone. This includes efforts we'll hear about in a minute to, to reduce decentralized growth like they're doing in Sacramento by examining existing land use patterns, density, urban form to find innovative solutions to challenges like housing, like carbon emissions, like agricultural preservation, and like job access. But to reiterate, it's not just a matter of how many jobs that can be reached, but what kinds of jobs. So while coordinated transit planning and land use is a necessary step, our analyses does demonstrate that those efforts must explicitly address the apparent mismatch between household access and job skills. And for their part, the largely successful transit-oriented development efforts of the past decades should probably be placing a stronger emphasis on locating jobs in these areas to complicate their strong residential focus. Lastly, we've got to, uh, to harness the power of information. Smart decision making begins with comprehensive and accurate data. However, this research project revealed that many agencies lack the fundamental pieces to construct the measures that are necessary for this next generation policy making. So we recommend that the federal government work with its metropolitan transit partners to maintain an updated database of standardized transit data. This information will not only help local leaders create better strategies and get the maximum benefit out of their own transit systems, but by having a comparable, consistent set of information, we think the federal government can then use job access as a key metric as it starts to experiment and award some types of discretionary grants, building on all the good efforts so far. So to demonstrate the power of this kind of information, we partnered with Microsoft to make the detailed findings of this project available on an interactive mapping tool that's available on the Brookings website. Each of you will be able to leave here today, I see people on their iPads already that are already doing this, <laughs> 
and personally investigate how transit performs in your metro area and in your neighborhood. We think this tool should serve as an example of what relatively small investments in data can do to dramatically improve infrastructure and other decision making. So let me then end with a quote from my favorite philosopher, Yogi Berra. <laughs> Yogi said, if you always do what you always did, you'll always get what you always got. <laughs> and one thing I think this report makes clear is that we just can't keep doing what we always did. We can't keep ripping the wires out of our metropolitan transit networks, nor can we just indiscriminately invest without purpose. This is definitely a time to invest in America, but we've got to invest smarter. By filling in the transit service gaps in our metropolitan networks, by going beyond transit and linking those investments up with how metropolitan areas grow and develop, and by deploying advanced technology and information systems to enable us to make better decisions. U.S. metropolitan areas, we think, have an awful lot to show for a century's worth of transit investment. But more needs to be done to ensure that transit connects workers to jobs here in the 21st century metropolis. And we think that now is the time to start doing that. Well, thank you very much for coming here today, and I'm very much looking forward to the discussion that follows.